I'm Catherine Arden, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Catherine Arden. You can find all of the archives of the show over at HankGarner.com. And when you're there, please click on the links on the right-hand sidebar to subscribe to the show. That way you don't miss an episode. Thank you to all of our sponsors. We're going to be telling you about them throughout the show uh, for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, go to HankGarner.com and click on the link to advertise. It's up at the top uh, menu bar. There's a brand new collection I'd like to tell you about. It's called Chronicles of Mirrorstone. 200 years ago, the Dwarven clans and the Elvish houses of Mirrorstone were at peace. The king of the dwarves, in a selfish and greedy mood, used his wizards to expand their mountain empire, raising new peaks from the forest floors of their elven neighbors. War and hatred ensued. The Chronicles of Mirrorstone offers a glimpse into the lives of the elves and dwarves living in the aftermath as they seek for a new peace. Six talented authors lend their voices to a tale of destruction, mistrust, and hope. The Chronicles of Mirrorstone. We knew it would be bad, but there are levels of bad. There was no scale that could have measured this one. Residents listened as 130 mile per hour winds tore away their roofs and struggled to stay alive as water crept into their homes, threatening to drown people in their living rooms. When the winds died and the rain finally stopped, the streets were only navigable by boat. The death toll rose to over 70 and more than 1 million cars flooded with an estimate of $100 billion in destruction. How does a community, a city, a state survive when hit by a monster storm and then have every square inch covered by over four feet of water? A storm which can only be described as a 1,000 year flooding event worse than Hurricane Katrina and broke all historical records. Lived through one man's experience as the world grew more and more uncertain. Experienced through the medium of social media the day-by-day visceral experience of watching people's lives permanently altered and the heart-filling moments when strangers, neighbors, and friends stepped up and helped those in trouble. Watch as needs are met, lives preserved, and hope restored in the two months following Harvey. Get your signed paperback copy of Two Months with Harvey by Terry R. Hill. Go to terryrhill.net. Proceeds from this project are going to benefit people still struggling in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. terryrhill.net. Two months with Harvey. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Catherine Arden on the show with me today and uh, to talk about her brand new book, The Girl in the Tower, as well as her book, The Bear and the Nightingale. Uh, Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited for you to be here. Um, Catherine, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, all right. First memory of wanting to be a writer. I feel like in my case, it snuck up on me quite gradually because I always loved telling stories. Um, as a little kid, I would, I loved bedtime because I would lie awake for hours and think up stories to myself. Um, I would write little books and like draw little pictures and give them to my very patient mother. Um, but I, but I never really connected my love of storytelling with wanting to be a writer. I loved books. Um, I loved to read. But it wasn't until quite late after college that I thought I would like to be a writer, like the writers that have books in bookstores. Um, and it, it was almost by, by happenstance I started writing a book um, that became Bear the Nightingale, mostly just to to see if I could do it, um, to to entertain myself also and I ended up finishing it and publishing it and 
the rest was was kind of history, I guess. That's awesome. Um, but but you always considered yourself a, a bit of a storyteller. I knew that I loved to do it. Um, I think knowing that you love something is a bit different than saying I am that or defining it that way. But yeah, I always loved telling stories. It was it was always been a passion of mine. I, I kind of have this pet theory, and and I'm always trying to get other people to help me prove it true or not. Um, okay. That uh, that people are born storytellers, and you either well, I think everyone uh, has the gene. Like this, it's the whole reason that that we as the the human race have survived all of these years is because we, uh, you know, we we teach through story, and they uh, oh, you know all. All we make sense of our lives through stories. Like we tell ourselves stories every day. It's so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, but some people like the the gene is just like automatically switched on, and uh, and then later in life, uh, you know, we we start learning the craft of storytelling, and then we become writers. And uh, so I, I love hearing people's journey of, of that discovery of, you know, uh, knowing that we love to tell stories and then seeing how that uh, kind of comes to fruition in, uh, you know, actually setting down to, to learn how to do the thing to put that on the page. Uh, so. I mean, honestly, I would say maybe the difference between like storytellers and people who write books for, for a living is just is just rock stubbornness. Like, because the, the, the act of learning to write a book takes a lot of time and effort and false starts and failures. And I think um, what gets you there is just being really stubborn <laughs> um, and just not taking no for an answer and being willing to, like, stare your terrible draft in the face and make it better instead of being like, I suck. Um, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and and yeah. one of the one of the things that that's always crazy to hear is uh, an author that says, you know, like I wrote thirteen books before I published my first one, and uh, you know, I just uh, I would get to the end of it, realize that book sucked, put it in a drawer, and start writing another one. And you know, there right. there are very few things in life uh, that you can do and and fail that many times, you know, if you want to look at it that way, uh, and say, you know what, I'm just going to keep going, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, when, when I was a kid, um, whenever like something difficult would happen, my mom would ask me, OK, did you win or did you learn? And I feel like that's a good way to approach life because either you won or you learned. And either way, it's a win. What a most excellent way to look at that. You know, and so like each time you write a book that doesn't go anywhere, you just you you, you learn something like finishing a book is is the most powerful thing you can do to become a writer because it's easy to start writing a book like anybody can write one chapter or two chapters but to finish a whole manuscript start to finish with like everything making sense that's hard and but it teaches you so much about how a book is created um so so yeah yeah if you if you have a room uh with a hundred people in it i i guarantee if you polled the room uh, 90 of those 100 people would tell you that they thought they had a book in them. Uh, and I, I would say a, a good half of them uh, could probably write a, a really great first chapter. Uh, and uh, the, the reality is, is, is that out of that room of 100 people, maybe one, uh, you know, if, if it's a crazy day, maybe two would ever actually get to the end of a book. I mean, but the difference is not that they're that, that the one is a better writer than the other ninety nine. It's just being stubborn enough to keep going. Exactly. It really is true. Like it is is it's yeah, that's the truth. You just gotta keep plugging away. That's right. That's um, right. Um so uh what did you think you were going to do uh with your life when you when you got out of school, well, well, first off, before we get to that, uh, what sort of, you said you were an avid reader. What sort of things did you like to read when you were younger? Oh my gosh. I read every, like there, I would read, I would read the back of the cereal box if there was nothing else in my eyesight to read. No, I read historical fiction. I read fantasy. I read contemporary, all novels for the most part. I didn't get into nonfiction until um, I got to college, but if it was a novel, I would read it. Um, it was actually kind of funny because I had a high reading level as a kid and, um, 
they, my teachers tried to find me books that like suited my reading level, but they didn't want me to read books that had like explicit like lovemaking or violence in them. And so there was this like sort of mad scramble to find adult books that um, were also kind of like tame in some ways. Cause I was pretty, I was like 12. Yeah. Um, and, and the response was to give me books from the 19th century, um, which often don't have explicit like love making or violence. So I, would, I read like Dracula. I read um, all of Sabatini's books like Captain Blood and the Sea Wolf. And just like, so I have this, I have this huge soft spot for um, late 19th, early 20th century adventure novels. The Scarlet Pimpernel. Um, I, God, there's so many and they're so good. So that's my my odd literary quirk, I guess. I love it. Like, uh, like, what do you do with the precocious child? Uh, but is not quite there yet. You you yeah. send them to the 19th century. That's it's, a- it's true though, because like everything's like euphemism in the 19th century. But like the Count of Monte Cristo, I made through Dumas, like all these like, adventurous books, and I love them. Although I, looking back, I got frustrated how few how few female characters. There were in 19th century adventure novels how, how um, few what female characters there uh, are yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an issue but yeah, it was a pretty male dominated uh, uh thing at the time oh man it really really was <laughs> um and then the female characters are invariably either like mothers or strumpets or wives there's like no other option right right but um they're still fantastic i i still have a soft spot for for books like that um, you said that you also liked uh, fantasy and uh, and stuff like that. What sorts of fantasy really intrigued you? I love Robin McKinley. Um, I still love Robin McKinley, the the hero and the crown. Her um, her novel that won the Newbery, um, the Blue Sword, which is its prequel, um, which is two books that I adored growing up. Um, I loved Sir Pierce, um, the Song of the Lions Quartet and the Wild Mage series. I just love those. Um, yeah, I, I read I read pretty widely, I guess. Um, I, 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 there's so many good books out there. It is, yeah. is the crazy, it's just, I loved, like, the Dark is Rising series, Susan Cooper series. Um, of course, Harry Potter. Once that came out, I ate those up. Um, yeah. Uh, what did you see yourself doing when you got out of school and uh, and was was thinking about careers? Ooh, well, I I spent most of college planning to be either a diplomat or an interpreter. I was a French and Russian major. Um, I studied abroad in Moscow for almost almost two years, eighteen months, and I studied abroad in France as well for even longer. And I had fluent French, fluent Russian, I was like going to do either government work or work for the UN or be an interpreter. Um, and I, I almost did. I I got to college still wanting that, but I was, I was so burnt out. Um, at the end of college that I decided to take a couple of months off and go work on a coffee farm in Hawaii. Like you do. As one does. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. My parents were so thrilled about this life choice of mine. (laughs) I bet they were. But I, I, I bounced off this coffee farm and I got I got kind of bored taking coffee. It's not the most exciting. It's also you get kind of caffeinated from the coffee. <laughs> you know, um, so I decided to write a book to pass the time. Essentially, I always loved reading fiction and I thought, well, turn my hand to writing it. And I, and I enjoy the process so much. Um, I just like to write. And so couple of months in, I was like, you know what, I'm going to finish this book and get it published. Um, not knowing how fraught that process can actually be. But in some, some ways, like being naive is good going in because you don't like see the obstacles. Right. You, you only the, see the possibilities. Yeah. You had the blessing of ignorance. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, before we get into that book, and I, I want to dig deep into that in just a minute, but um, what was it uh, that first intrigued you about, um, you know, wanting to study abroad, but to uh, to uh, to study these different cultures and languages? What was it about the other? Was it the, you know reading some of those classics like Dumas and, and things like that 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 uh, kind of intrigued you about France, or uh, was it something else? 
I mean, I just had this like urge to have adventures. And I think that was partially due to the fact that I was reading so much fiction that I still read so much fiction. I just wanted to have exciting things happen. And so I figured the best way to have exciting things happen was to study abroad. Um, so I did a year of high school in France. Um, and then I did the year after high school. I was in Russia for a year. And then I became a French and Russian major in undergrad and went back abroad um, while I was a student. So I, I just spent quite a bit of time in France and in Russia. And I, I just, I don't know. I always wanted that feeling when something's difficult, but you make it work anyway. I love that feeling. I love challenges. Um, I think that's why I ended up writing books because a book is the ultimate thing that's hard to do but you feel good when you do it um so i think the same applies to wanting to learn languages and study abroad and live abroad what was your parents response uh when you said i would like to go live in another country while i'm still in high school oh boy they were supportive um they were definitely supportive they were as parents can be nervous um, I think the more nerve wracking one was when I went to Moscow as a 19 year old because I went, I, I just showed up in Moscow and I enrolled at this Russian institution called the Pushkin Institute um, that was established for teaching Russian to foreigners. So it wasn't under like the blessing of an American program. It was just me in Russia. Um, so it, it definitely, I think, rated a little higher on the oh my god scale but um but i think my parents understood that it's better to risk something yeah than not uh what year would that have been when you when you landed in russia with with just you and russia the first time it was 2007 been 10 years ago now okay so um, definitely post-Soviet Russia, uh, but, you know, the um, I, I would think that each year uh, that that uh, that moves forward from the Soviet era, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure and the uh, kind of society is 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 moving forward exponentially every year. So uh, you, you probably I, I can just imagine uh, that going from, you know, a typical American upbringing to landing in Russia uh, in 2007 was a bit of culture shock. It was definitely culture shock. I was just coming off. I did when I was 16 at a year in France. So I, I think culture shock is never so great as the first time you go abroad for a long time. So I'd already like done it once at that point and had some confidence going in. But, but Moscow of course is like a totally different um, ball game to a small town in France. Um, but I mean, Russia is a, it's a funny place. Like, like there's, there's this division between people who grew up in the Soviet Union, people who grew up after it fell. Um, and, and there's this almost this, this schizophrenia of, of values and outlooks and um, almost personalities between people who grew up as Soviets and people who grew up as Russians. Um, but it was such a fascinating place to be. Moscow is a beautiful city. Um, absolutely beautiful. And, and there's so much to see there, like just parks and forests and, of course, things like Red Square. Just, you know, you could spend a year there going to see stuff every day and never get to the end. Um, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. What do you think endeared you the most to uh, Russian culture and, and to Russian history? Uh, because your, your books are really kind of immersed uh, in this, this old world uh, Russian, you know, kind of a uh, literary tradition and uh, the, the whole look and feel and, uh, it, you know, the whole, uh, everything about it just kind of bleeds, uh, you know, old Russia. I mean, I love Russian history. Um, I love the drama of it. I love the ups and downs. Um, I love the combination of like Western and Eastern values and thought and like how it mingles in Russia. Russia's always had this like sort of divide between like looking west and looking east culturally and that's really fascinating um russian literature is amazing again with the, the drama the highs and lows like this, this this passion for life i think 
is very evident in Russian literature. Um, with Bear the Nightingale, I set it in what became Russia um, in Muscovy during the Middle Ages. And what I wanted to do there was to to present the sort of vision, this sort of like fantastical vision of Russia before all the things we associate with Russia existed. Like in the 1350s, there's no onion domes, there's no czars, there's no, I don't know, troikas, there's no Lenin, you know, it's just all these things that we, we think of as Russian aren't there. And so it enabled the reader to approach this country and this mythology and this place, hopefully from a, from a, a, a perspective that's free of stereotype, um, which I, I, I don't know, I, I would love for people to see Russia um, for itself and not for all of the cliches and the, and the, and the stereotypes that we have in the West. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, total, uh, total coincidence. But, uh, over the last two weeks, uh, I have interviewed, you are the third author, uh, that, um, that studied, uh, Russian literature, uh, in, in college and then went on to write books that have this sort of, uh, you know, ancient Russia inspired, uh, you know, literary tradition. And, uh, I, I just wonder if there's, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just so curious. Who are the other two? Well, Evelyn Skye. Uh, oh, okay. was, yeah, on the show, my favorite fantasy, but definitely inspired by that. Uh, mm-hmm. And Lee Bardugo, uh, whose you know newest book of short stories is, uh, you know, is, is a, a retelling of a lot of Russian and kind of Eastern European stories. Uh, so I, I just wonder if there's something culturally going on uh, that we are, uh, you know, digging back and, and trying to uncover these uh, these kind of deep seated uh, traditional things uh, and, and get past those stereotypes like you're talking about and, and get past the things that we associate with what Russia is and some of these, these uh, older societies and traditions. I mean, I think there is an urge among writers. Maybe I think more than anything to move out of the West, like to move from the mythology of Western Europe and to look elsewhere for, ideas for stories um and and rush is kind of this like this like interesting target because it's familiar and strange at the same time um and, and russian folklore and slavic mythology is so rich um it's rich in like characters and in stories and and just things that writers need to write novels with just all these ideas floating around. So I think that's the reason people all um, want to mine it. Cause there's a lot to mine. You know? yeah. well, and you start realizing that we have so much in our kind of collective consciousness that is informed by that already. A, a lot of our, our fairy tales and, and, and things like that, we have pieces of it and they've been very Westernized and sanitized and, 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 you know, the rough edges uh, and the, the unsettling things have kind of been sanded off. Uh, you know, for for mass market consumption, but the the kernel of it is is kind of you know still there. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think um, fairy tales are one of those things that show us that we have that people have more in common um, than they think because there's similar like tropes and similar characters to be found in different fairy tales across the world, um, like brave maidens and wicked witches and and I don't know princes like these characters sort of cross cross cultures so okay. you're you you finish college with the uh with with a mind to go into diplomacy or, or something like that but when you get to the end of college you're just kind of completely burnt uh so you wind up on a coffee farm in hawaii <laughs> um why did why did you pick hawaii and and um, you know being so polar opposite to what you had immersed yourself in for the last you know the the previous four to six years or whatever well, you have to realize i went to college in vermont um, by the time I finished college, I had spent almost two years in Moscow. I had spent three years in Vermont. Both those places are very cold. Yeah. And so I looked around and I'm like, okay, where is it not cold? <laughs> and my answer was Hawaii is not cold. Like that, that's literally my entire thought process. It was not profound. Um, 
I love it. That's, that's, that's what I did. And I was like, great, I'm going there. And so I packed a backpack, like got a one way ticket. And I spent the next like six months living in a tent, um, hitchhiking everywhere, picking coffee and eventually writing what became Bear in the Nightingale. That's so cool. Uh, you're, you're originally from Texas, aren't you? I am from Austin, Texas. Yeah, so the the cold weather climbs, I, I would imagine, were getting the the better of you by that point. I was a little, I was a little tired of it. Yeah. It's just the winter can get you down. It's dark. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. it's snowy. It's yeah. long. All those things. So you decide to write a book, and uh, just to exercise those muscles into, you know, you'd been a fan of reading, so why not write? I, I think that's a, a similar thought that a lot of writers have, that um, I've, I've enjoyed this my whole life. I think I could tell a story, too. Um, what was that first inspiration that you remember, um, you know, for, for this particular story? So for Bear and the Nightingale, it's, it's, very, it's very clear the inspiration. I had this image in my head of a family sitting around this like giant Russian oven and the Russian oven, the pitch in the middle ages was almost the size of a room. It's enormous. Um, people would sleep on top of it in cold weather. Um, it was as big as a bed or bigger. Um, and I had this image of a family sitting around this giant oven telling stories, um, in bad weather, like with, with a storm outside. And, um, I had no other idea, but I was, I was going to go with this one like image. So I wrote down what became chapter one of Bear and the Nightingale, in which a family is sitting around telling a story. And since I had no clear notion of how to start a book, I started by simply retelling a fairy tale in the context of the scene, um, which got me through chapter one without too much invention on my part, which is helpful for a young writer. Um, yeah. and the, the fairy tale that, that is retold in chapter one of Bear the Nightingale then became like a touchstone, um, for the rest of the novel, which grabs like themes and characters and ideas from the fairy tale and expands them in real life in the book. And after the first chapter, I just kind of shoved words together. Um, without any clear notion of what I was doing. And um, I remember when I first had to write dialogue, I panicked. I was, I was like, what would they say? What do people say when they talk? Like, I really got nervous. Um, and, and my first efforts were, were truly terrible, which is why I think anyone can write a book. You just got to be stubborn. Um, but eventually I kind of like wrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it again and got somewhere. Eventually. Took a while. Were you living in the tent when you started writing this? Oh, yeah. I was living in a tent next to the beach. Um, there was this random dog who had adopted me, so she shared my tent. Um, she was great. I, my, my tan was fantastic. I swam a lot. Um, my earliest drafts were written in a very kind of salt-stained notebook. Um, yeah, it was a crazy time. It really was. So, so you're just writing this out longhand. Uh, do, I, I would assume that the, the the there wasn't a lot of editing going on. You were just trying to get the story out as you uh, as it came to you. I was just trying to get it out. I mean, in those early days, I had no real thoughts of like sharing it. It was just entertain myself, and so um, it was more for the pleasure of writing words down than it was for having those words make sense. Um. And result, the early drafts did not make sense. But um, I still enjoyed the process, which is the most important thing, I think. Um, at what point, Catherine, did you realize that this was more than uh, just, uh, you know, an exercise to, to keep you busy? When, when did you realize that this was an actual story and, uh, you know, that it had substance to it? I mean, I never really thought about it having substance. I guess my... I enjoyed the process so much. Um, and in taking this sort of pause in Hawaii after college, I was, I had paused in the first place because I felt like I was trying to decide the course of my whole life. And I wanted to choose a career that brought me joy. Um, and I was worried that I was hurtling towards this 
predetermined destination without really asking myself, is what I'm doing something that will make me happy long term? And writing this book made me so happy. Um, not even just just the act of writing words down and telling a story made me happy. And I decided to pursue it as a career, not because I had a ton of faith in The Bear and the Nightingale or in that story, but because I wanted to chase that feeling of contentment, of, of joy, of, of, of delight often. Um, so that's what made me pursue it and keep pursuing it till the bitter end. Nick Breaker's book, Essence, book one Septima, one of the best science fiction writers I know. Nick Breaker weaves some of the best science fiction adventure stories you'll ever read. Essence, book one Septima is a must read. Go pick it up today. There's a link to it in the show notes. Third Scribe is the place for authors and readers to meet. Go to thirdscribe.com. You can set up an account for free and you can link up with some of your favorite authors and find out what's going on with them. Authors, you need to have a a place where you can highlight your books to your audience. Thirdscribe.com is built especially around books, linking people that love books with people that write books. Go visit them today. Thirdscribe.com. Tell Rob and the folks that I sent you. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode 20, just dropped today. It is amazing with stories by Jess West, Rhett Bruno, Eamon Ambrose, Bob Williams. Tales is my favorite monthly publication. Go pick it up today and get that old pulp goodness feeling. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode number 20, out right now. Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia, 13 stories of animals and humans interacting at the end of the world. Uh, this project also benefits Pets for Vets, one of uh, the most outstanding charities out there, linking up rescue animals with veterans that need some companionship. So go pick up a copy of Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia. It's only 99 cents while it launches. At the end of the show, don't forget we have an audio book clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. When writing The Bear and the Nightingale, was there ever a point where um, you felt like uh, that you needed to put research into the book or, or that it was a, a very intentional uh, thing that you were writing this sort of uh, Russian-inspired fairy tale uh, for the modern world? Or was this just you were so steeped in this culture and tradition that it just kind of poured out that way? Oh, I did quite a bit of research. Um, as a Russian major, I had focused on 20th century poetry, um, which is not the most helpful for um, for for medieval medieval history. So I I did research, you know, the old fashioned way. Libraries. Um, I bought old books on Amazon. Um, I borrowed books. I read articles. Um, I would write, come to a question, research it, find an answer, find a new fun fact, use that. You know, just I let the writing inform the research and the research inform the writing. There was like this two two legged stool kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, um yeah. so when you when you finished a, a complete draft um, did you, you know, then, uh, you know, get it into the computer and start trying to wrangle it? And, uh, kind of what was your revision process like after you got the first draft done? I, so I typed kind of as I went, I would write, you know, 10 and 12 pages, then type them up, um, revising as I typed. Um, and then once it was all in the computer, I just, I would just open it up, read a little bit, like fix a few things, read it more, fix some more things. I didn't, it just, I just kept massaging it like almost word by word until one day I was like, awesome, it's done. Um, then of course, when I ended up telling it, the my, my editor asked me to cut the book in half and revise the first half. So, so the editorial process um, that I went through with there was much more intensive than the one I went through by myself. How how big was that initial book? Um, the initial book was 120,000 words. Okay. 110 maybe. Um, the final book was 99. 
So what ended up happening is I cut it down to like 60,000 words and then rewrote it. Um, and the final book was not quite as long as it had been, but not too far off either. Um, but it was a massive rewriting process. Yeah. Um, we talked in the beginning about this uh, kind of blissful ignorance about the, the way publishing works. Um, when, when you had that, that draft finished and you had kind of edited and, and you were happy enough with it that you felt like uh, that you wanted to, uh, you know, find a way to get this book out, what uh, kind of what path did you follow? How did you, uh, you know, go about finding your, your agent and, and getting the, the book pitched and all of that good stuff? Um, so... With my agent, it was pretty fortuitous. Um, I had a a family friend who was a professional writer and editor, and um, she agreed to read my book as a favor to my parents, and she really liked it. And so she um, introduced me to some agents that she knew, and um, one of those ended up referring me to my current agent. Um so I didn't go through like the the really brutal query process um, that I know authors can go through. It was sort of like like referral, referral. I met my current agent, and he took me on. And and that's uh that that's wonderful. Uh, but that's that's not always the hard part. Uh, yeah, the, the getting the agent and then uh, you know working with them to uh, kind of get the book in shape to pitch. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, how long was the process from, uh, kind of reworking the, the book with your agent and then getting it actually with a publisher? I mean, my agent, we didn't really do much revising. Um, like he gave me a couple of suggestions and I reworked it a little bit, but not much. Um, it was maybe a week or two's worth of like fiddling with the, with my script. Um, the heavy editing came once we'd sold it. Um, and honestly, I signed with my agent in July of 2014 and then, um, he took it out in September and, um, in three weeks we sold it. So it was, it was a fairly, it was a fairly smooth process. Um, and I know that's not the case for everyone. I wish I had a better, a more dramatic <laughs> story. I wish I had a dramatic story, <laughs> but once once the once 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 that happened it was just kind of like well well this is great um well that's but, awesome but, i mean your story is your story you know there, but, there's but, no you know just yeah. because you didn't you know lie in a gutter for six months that you know doesn't make your story any any less interesting i mean i lived in a tent for six months right right I, once i left the tent i lived in a yurt for a while and then i moved to a shack um and then I finally upgraded to a converted yoga studio. And the first one of those places that had a indoor toilet was the yoga studio. So I definitely like paid my, my, my attic dues. It <laughs> wasn't an attic. It was a yurt. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, and the book uh, landed with Del Rey, didn't it? Yeah. Well, actually it sold to Ballantyne. Um, and then it got moved to Del Rey a couple of months in. Um, did they just feel like Del Rey was a better vehicle? Yep, they did. I, I love Del Rey. Like they, they are so supportive and so nice and just the most fantastic people. Um, and I, I feel so fortunate that I ended up with them in the end. Just absolutely fortunate. Well, yeah. And uh, so the, the book gets published. It's got this fantastic cover. Uh, that really captures the emotion and the and the feel of the book. Um, and when the when the book kind of came out to the world, it, it started getting a lot of buzz. Uh, what was your reaction to uh, you know uh, the way people were were receiving the book? I mean, it was kind of unreal to me because I guess it had been this thing in my head for so long that it was so strange seeing other people reading and responding to it. And also, honestly. Whenever I reread or look at Baron the Nightingale, all I can see is the flaws. Um, and I'm sure that's true of every writer, but but um, but part of you is just like disbelieving that people are enjoying your work, um, because definitely you know months and months of revisions saps all the joy out of reading your own work. Um, 
and and all that's left is like you you made made it as you know as good as you can but you can still see like where there's flaws and problems that you wish you'd fixed so so yeah, it's it's kind yeah. of like acting in a play um you know you you do months of rehearsals and uh by the time it's opening night you are completely sick of the show uh none of the jokes are funny none of the emotional moments are uh, you know uh, are resonating at all and you're just sick of it um until you get on stage and you actually get the audience's feedback and then you're like reminded about why this thing is so great uh it, it's a it's a little bit like that with publishing you, through the revision you're just sick of the thing but then when when you see that that people are connecting with it, it it kind of puts it in a new light. It's true. It really does. Um seeing your work through somebody else's eyes is rewarding. I mean, I think one of the great tricks of of revising a book is finding a way to see your work through fresh eyes over and over again. Um even if you've read the same scene like 80 times because the second you lose that like spark of like freshness, it becomes very hard to objectively judge. Um, where your book is and what it still needs. So I think that's a great trick is trying to figure out how to like keep it fresh as a writer. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the the new book, the girl in the tower, in the tower, girl in the tower, <laughs> the, right. the girl in the tower. I got tongue tied. Um, is uh, is brand new and uh, and coming out. Uh, you said that the um, the first book you chopped in half at your editor's uh request is this the second half or 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 are the pieces of that second half that you cut out in this book oh god what a deep question um so originally in writing the second book i was going to use the the lost second half of the first book and i spent 8 months trying at the end of 8 months it was like nope um not working and so i scrapped it um, with which with much grief, I scrapped it and um, started over, scrapped it again um, after a few more months and ended up on the third try writing the book from start to finish in six months. Um, but it was this like, it was such an intense process of like getting far, dead ending, starting over, getting far, dead ending, starting over again. Um, it was, it was definitely dramatic in its own way um and 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 through it all my editor was so patient she just she'd read she'd comment she'd wait and read and comment and wait until um we got to a good place after about a year and a half of just wrestling with it um but there's little tiny pieces of the old second half of Baron Nightingale in The Girl in the Tower but um a lot of it most of it's new you know, I, I repurposed what I could, but um, but the story ended up going in a different direction. And so I have this giant, like, ghostly manuscript, like an, like an alternate universe book or a, like a fanfic. Maybe I'll, I'll post it on my website sometime. Here's how it could have happened. Oh, that would be <laughs> awesome. That would be awesome. Um, I, uh, I actually interviewed... Uh, Andy Weir this morning, uh, early so this cool. morning. Yeah. And, uh, he, uh, he was on the show a couple of years ago, right before the movie adaptation of the Martian came out. And, mm. uh, and, and he came on to the, his, his new book is coming out uh, in a couple of weeks and, and we were talking about it and, uh, you know, he had come off this phenomenal success with the Martian and, you know, Matt Damon is in a movie, you know, about his book and all that. Cool. And he's writing, uh, you know, a, a follow up to that. And, uh, and he realized when he had written 70,000 words of a new book that just wasn't any good and it just wasn't working. And he had to completely scrap it and, and start all over from scratch. So, um, you're definitely not alone there. And, uh, but yep. what, what a, what a disheartening feeling to realize that you've invested so much in something and it's just not working. And I guess that's when that, uh, that writer's, uh, tenacity and, you know, being a little hard headed, uh, really comes in and, and, and kicks in and saves the day. It really does. I mean, being stubborn helps, but also I think it's important to think in your brain that the work you put in doing 
a discarded draft, the work isn't gone. Like it's informing your thought processes. Like it's helped you get to a better place to write your book. Um, and oftentimes like sort of the ghost of your old ideas, like finds its way into your new, new material, um, in some way or another. So, so I don't think time spent drafting is wasted time. And I'm sure, I'm sure Andy feels the same. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's brutal, like discarding a huge, like book length piece, but it's also, I mean, it's like, did you win or did you learn? It's like the most helpful mantra for life. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, so tell us the, the setup, uh, for the story of the girl in the tower, in the tower. If, uh, if you're, uh, you know, fans, uh, of the bear and the nightingale, uh, where does this book come in and are they connected or is this a, a completely separate story? Uh, kind of give us what this is about. Yeah. Um, they are connected. Um, girl in the tower picks up pretty much where bear and the nightingale left off. Um, that being said, each novel stands alone and can be read as its own story. Um, and being able to refer to the first book is helpful. Um, in the second book, it's not completely necessary. Um, there have been folks who have picked up and enjoyed Girl in the Tower without having read The Bear and the Nightingale. Um, whereas The Bear and the Nightingale took place on a small farm um, north of Moscow, The Girl in the Tower takes place largely in Moscow. Um in medieval Moscow and it treats more with the politics um, and the history of the time period. Um, There's more intrigue and maybe a little bit less like magic than in the first book. Um, Same characters, some, some characters from the first book that kind of vanished early on are back in this novel um, as point of view characters and Um, A lot more drama, a lot more of a fast pace in this book. It covers about six weeks in time instead of the first book covered 16 years. Um, So it's a different feel of a book. It was a different challenge than writing Bear the Nightingale. Um, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You said that the first book uh, was was more kind of magical in tone, and and this one deals with uh, intrigue and uh, the kind of the mystery of that. Uh, those are, uh, you know, apart from the setting that these are in, uh, you know, those could be two very different genre, you know, books if you you know just extracted the core of the story. Um, what are some of the the skills that uh, that you had to learn? in shifting gears over to what sounds like more of a uh, more of a, an adult um that's not the right word more of a you know a, a more mature subject matter maybe um i'm not I, I guess i guess the bear and the night yells is the series it's called the winter night series right these three books they follow the main character vaslisa from birth until sort of the end of the third book um when she's an adult and and the books track her growing up. And I think in large part, the magical tone of the first book was to do with the fact that Vasilisa, the main character, is a child um, almost throughout the entire novel. And, and I think her growing up is reflected in this like, sort of like peaceful, lyrical, um, like magical tone. Whereas in the second book, she's 16 years old. She's in full rebellion mode. And, um, and I think in large part, the the faster pacing and the intrigue of the second book reflects the growing up of the main character. Um, as far as like skills go, honestly, I think telling a story is telling a story. And, um, I think the same skills of just like putting one word in front of the other serve, serve you. However, the story goes, whether it becomes more of a mystery, more of a thriller, um, more action, more romance, more whatever. Um, just telling your story and be true to your characterizations um, are kind of what pulls you through, regardless. Um, and when you started this book, uh, since you had uh, completed the first book and then, uh, you know, you had the, the second half of the first book, uh, you had written a lot of words uh, by the time you started on the second book. 
and did your, of course, your, your process changed because, uh, you know, the, when you started the first one, uh, you were just kind of exploring the idea of writing. Uh, when you started writing the second book, you're, you're not exploring the idea anymore. You're a professional and you, you know, have to write a story that meets certain demands and, and all of that. Uh, what was that, uh, that feeling like for you, uh, you know, sitting down now as an accomplished author to write, you know, the follow up? I mean, the thing is, like, second book is a huge challenge for every writer because your first book, it's like, whatever. I don't know if I can finish. There's no pressure to have it be good. You're just, like, trying to get to the end. But by your second book, you're like, oh, my God, I got to do this. I have a deadline. I have an editor. I, it has to be good. Um, and that, that pressure can be quite paralyzing. Um, I can only imagine what it's like for people who have, like, really spectacular debuts and they have to follow it up with, it, with a new novel. Um, like Andy Weir, for example, just, just the pressure. Right. Um, so, so I, I guess the second book is, is in some ways a bigger challenge than the first because you're still trying to figure out this book thing, but with pressure. Um, the third book, and I, I've, I, I finished drafting my third book a few weeks ago. Um, was much easier because with The Girl in the Tower, I went through every possible kind of failure um, and bounced back to finish it and have it be a book that I'm proud of. Um, so by the time the third book rolled around, I'm, I felt pretty chill. But I think the second book, it was a challenge for me, and I think it's a challenge for many writers. Um, oh. I'm excited to hear that the third book is is drafted. Uh, I, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming you you'll go through a you know a, a period of editing and all that before it's uh, will it be published next year? Uh, do you think? I think it'll end up being December of 2018. Um, it's on track for that as far as being finished. It's a question um, of scheduling, but it'll be ready. Uh, what were your your feelings about uh, kind of closing that story that you started? Uh, you know, in, in such a magical way, you know, on the coffee farm and right. in, in, in Hawaii, uh, as, as you reach the end of that trilogy, uh, was that a, a feeling of accomplishment? Was it uh, a little melancholy? I mean, definitely. I felt proud that it's, that it's winding up. It's not quite finished yet. There's still several like editing rounds sure. to go, but it's honestly, I'm so excited to do a new thing. Um, I, I, I want to like finish with medieval Russia and go to a different place, different time, different story, different people. Um, and I'm so eager for that challenge. So I'm kind of in this, like, bring it on mode. I'm ready to, to, it's been five years of my life on this, this trilogy. Um, so I'm, I'm ready to, to move on. I'm excited to move on. Um, I have a middle grade book coming out in August, I think. Um, it's a middle grade horror novel called Small Spaces um, that I'm excited to to show people. Oh, that's awesome! Um, do, is that uh, do you have uh, plans for that novel yet? Um, it's I it um it's a book I drafted in between editorial rounds for The Girl in the Tower, and um, ended up doing a two book deal for it um, with a different publisher. And, um, I think it's, it's still early stages yet. It needs more editing, but, um, it'll be out in the fall of next year. Oh, nice. nice. Um, and, and I love horror novels, so I'm excited for this guy. It's a fun, oh, fun project. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, but the, the new book is the girl in the tower, the girl in the tower. and, and, uh, we're excited for this book to get out to the world. Um, I've been reading a pre, a pre-release copy of it and it is amazing. Um, I love it. And, uh, uh, Catherine, if, if people are not familiar with your work and, and all that you do, where can they find you online to follow along? Um, on Twitter at Arden underscore Catherine, um, or on Facebook at Catherine Arden author or my website, which is CatherineArden.com. 
Wonderful. Uh, Catherine, we wish you much success with the, the girl in the tower, and I hope that, uh, that it, uh, is bigger and better than the first book, and, uh, and we just wish you much success. So thank you for taking time to come on the I, show. I, I hope so too, and thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, best of luck to you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. I found Absalom in the parlor by the fireplace. Irving had encouraged his guests to reenact the famous Van Tassel party of the legend and tell ghost stories. The brandy poured freely, the men smoked and the chestnut tails of the region were trotted out one by one in parade. The White Lady of Raven Rock, the ghost of poor Major André, hanged from the tulip tree aside the post road, and, of course, the headless horseman. Did you ride that night, Brom? asked young Joseph Martling. Was it you that affrighted the schoolteacher? Brom sat, and all eyes were on him. Whatever the truth, I hope his son will forgive my part in it. There's nothing to forgive, said the son of Ichabod. It's a grand work, Mr. Irving, a grand fiction. On the mantel, a bronze clock chimed eleven. Tis almost the witching hour, said Irving. Time for all children to be abed, lest they be caught on the road. I would not be caught dead on the road tonight, said Martling, who lived nearby. Why not, said I. Let us ride Ichabod's route back to Beekmantown in commemoration. The young men cheered the idea. I turned to Absalom. Would you join us? No. It's absurd. The sleepy hollow boys jeered at him. Absalom sighed. Very well, then. We will ride together as a group. The gloom that found us on the road was terrible. In those days, no gas lights lit the post road, and the way from Roost to the bridge crossing still wound past Wildy Swamp, fearfully black at that hour. I watched Absalom riding to my left. He was a thin, spectral thing in the moonlight. Idle talk died on our lips, and our small band rode with only the sound of horse hooves for accompaniment. There it is whispered Martling. The hanging tree. The old tulip tree twisted against the starry sky. The road broke to either side of it. That is where your father is said to have first seen the thing. My companion had slowed, gazing fearfully at the branches above. I saw something, he whispered. I saw a body swinging from the tree. Come now, Absalom. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? Hurry up, then. Quick, before the horseman rides. You can't reason with a headless man. As if on cue, a wind rose. Branches tore and leaves swept the air. A terrible cracking laugh rose all around. Eyes opened and watched us from the deep. The faces of spirits appeared. Horrors rose from the Andre Brook. Our horses whinnied and reared. Absalom grabbed my arm and pointed. The horseman stood on the slope above. He raised his hatchet. His army of ghosts fell upon us. My horse and I turned circles, terrorized and confused. Young Martling shouted, We have to make the bridge! and rode off. Make the bridge! cried the others as one, and our companions scattered, tearing up the post road with a clatter of frantic hooves. Make the bridge! The horseman gathered his form and lunged at Absalom. Young Crane dodged the blade, dug heels into the flanks of his steed, and fled. Cries of, Make the bridge! echoed all around. Where? cried Absalom, galloping into the swamp, his voice distant and small. Where is the bridge? Someone tell me! Help! He was gone before I could answer. Yet what could I have said? The bridge of legend is gone, torn down. It shall never be crossed again. I watched Absalom splash into Wildy Swamp, the horseman in pursuit. 
and I knew what his fate would be.